pressure's off the line. Hey guys, welcome to my video on Audi's RS4 Avant versus BMW's G80 M3 Competition X-Drive. With the M3 Touring just around the corner and Audi about to launch a special competition spec RS4, I thought it would be a good idea to refresh our minds on what these two cars are like compared to each other. Now, before anyone accuses me of being BMW biased, because it's no secret that I do have a soft spot for BMW, I'd like to remind you that a few months ago, I shot a video on Audi's RS3 versus BMW's M240 iX drive, and the RS3 came out on top of that particular contest. The B9 RS4 Avant was launched back in 2018, and I have fond memories of that car and of the UK launch because it was the first Audi launch that I was invited on. A couple of years ago, Audi mildly updated the RS4 to this, which I guess you'd call the B9.5. As with much of Audi's lineup, the RS4 is available in a number of trim levels. This particular car is the carbon black edition and it sits at 75,700 pounds. That's about £5,000 more than the base spec RS4 and a whopping 11 grand less than their flagship Vorsprung model. The Vorsprung model always tends to come with pretty much every possible option bar the carbon ceramic brake option. There will also be a competition spectrum as we've touched upon and that will retail at just under what the Vorsprung costs, so just over 80 grand probably. And that'll be coming to the channel very soon. Once we jump inside, we'll go through some of the standard spec that this RS4 Carbon Black Edition comes with. The G80 is a newer car. It's only been around for about 18 months. It was initially launched in rear wheel drive only. And then about 12 months ago, they launched uh, the X-Drive version, you can buy both now, rear wheel drive or X-Drive. And a base spec M3 Competition X-Drive will retail at £81,000. That's about £5,500 more expensive than this particular Carbon Black Edition. But it does come with more standard equipment and on paper at least, it looks a bit punchier. But once again, we'll go through the standard equipment of this car once we jump inside. The RS4 is powered by this 2.9 litre V6 twin turbo, produces 450 horsepower and 600 newton metres of torque. All of that power and torque is fed to the ground via Audi's Quattro system and ZF's eight speed automatic gearbox. Audi claim this 1720 kilo car will do the 0-62 sprint in just 4.1 seconds and go on to a limited top speed of 155 miles an hour. If you go for the Vorsprung trim, the top level car, the limiter is lifted from 155 to 174. But if you live in the UK, that's probably not gonna to be too relevant. The M3 has this S58 engine. It's a three liter straight six, twin turbo produces 510 horsepower and 650 newton meters of torque so that's 60 horsepower up on the rs4 and 50 newton meters up and all of that power and torque is fed to the ground through bmw's mx drive system and yes you guessed it a zf eight speed automatic gearbox bmw claim this car will do the 0 to 62 sprint in 3.5 seconds and go on to the same limited top speed of 155 miles an hour. This particular M3 Competition X Drive weighs in at 1,755 kilos, so it's a bit heavier than the RS4, but not much. As this is my car, I wanted to caveat that I do have an e-venturi carbon intake and a full Miltec exhaust system. 
that might give it a couple of extra horsepower, although all of that is controlled by the ECU and the ECU is completely stock. Jumping inside the RS4, well, firstly, let's just talk about its practicalities. It's an Avant or an Estate. And until the M3 Touring comes out, this is definitely the most practical car. We've got 505 litres of boot space back there before you fold the rear seats down. When you fold those down, you've got 1,510 litres. So you've got a lot of space and a lot of practicality. In terms of rear bench space, well, it's not too bad. I can just about squeeze in there behind this driving position. It's very rare that you're going to have someone of six foot four in the front and in the back, but if you did, you could squeeze, let's say, four of us in here. Uh, there are three seats on the rear bench, but you'd only really want to use the central one for shorter journeys because it's not particularly comfortable. Uh, you are um, lacking <laughs> any footwell space as well because of the transmission tunnel and it does sit quite a bit higher. Up front, well, driving position is okay. It's certainly better than Audis and let's say Volkswagen Group cars of old, uh, but compared to the M3 and some other modern machinery, I do feel like I'm sitting rather high and you're probably sick of me saying that, but I do like to point it out. I think for anyone six foot and under, it's actually gonna be a really nice uh, driving position. It's very adjustable. But once again, these seats, I've talked about them before, they're just so small for me. <laughs> I feel like I'm a giant in this car. My shoulders and my torso just don't really fit at all in these seats. My head is miles above uh, the head restraint that's not adjustable on these RS bucket seats, I think they call them. So they're not the most comfortable and they're certainly not supportive enough. And typically Audi as well, the ergonomics in here, at least for me, just don't seem right. I can't rest my elbows on um, the armrest and the door card and hold the wheel with any kind of purchase along the journey. So I have to actually hold the wheel like that um, because yeah, if I'm down here, I just can't grab the wheel. And I know that might sound trivial, but when you're doing very long journeys, uh, that is very important to me. In terms of the cabin itself, well, it is starting to feel its age. You've got to remember that this architecture is from an A4 that was launched in, what, 2015 or 2016? So it's getting on now. And yes, they did update it a couple of years ago, but I don't think the update really did it many favours because you got rid of some of the uh, MMI controls from down here and replaced it with a completely useless ashtray. Uh, this particular car has lots of piano black trim down here, which I'm sure looks amazing in the showroom, but 7,000 miles and nine months of press use at least, there are scratches and marks all over it and it looks terrible. The carbon on the other hand looks really good. And that brings me on nicely to what comes standard in this carbon black edition. You get 20 inch wheels and in fact the RS4 is a square setup so it's 275 section 20 inch wheels all round. We've got matrix LED headlamps, we've got this RS specific virtual cockpit which I really like, it's very adjustable. It's a shame they've got rid of that center sort of rev counter option and replaced it with something slightly different and angular um, but it still does a really good job, it's very clear the graphics are very very good. We've got these RS Super Sport seats uh, that are heated and covered in Nappa leather. They're also electric, but curiously, they don't have memory. So I kind of struggle to understand the logic in that. When you've got electric seats, surely the main benefit is having a memory on them so that when I'm driving, it's let's say memory one, and when Lou's driving, it's memory two. It also comes with the RS exhaust and the RS Sport suspension, which isn't adaptive, but we'll talk about that once we get it out on the road. Uh, we've got some uh, black roof rails, black door mirror caps, and bits of carbon um, along the front, a small little splitter, I guess you could call it, and little carbon canards, and around the back you've got a carbon diffuser. So all of that comes standard on this carbon black edition. This particular car 
is in uh, turbo blue paint, which I absolutely love, although it seems to have disappeared off the configurator, so I'm not sure if that's still available. I think it contrasts very well with the black wheels and the carbon stuff on the outside. The only optional extra that I believe it has is the head-up display, and that's about a thousand pounds. Definitely worth having in any modern car, especially one of this sort of price point, that's gonna make very little difference to your PCP payments or your overall price. Now we're inside the M3, a very familiar place for me at least. Before we talk about the interior, I just wanna point out that BMW recently, as in very recently, updated the interior of the M3 and the M4. If you order one today or pick a new one up from the showroom, you'll be, greeted with the curved display that you get in cars like the i4 and the iX. The verdict is out as to whether that's an upgrade, but it definitely makes the interior feel ultra modern. It does remove a lot of these really useful climate control buttons, and a lot of it is now touchscreen, but BMW do still give you their brilliant iconic iDrive controller. In terms of practicalities, well, this M3 Saloon actually gives you a 480 litre boot. That's only 25 litres smaller than the RS4. And in terms of rear cabin space, well, it's difficult to say. The M3 certainly has a bit more legroom, but I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that this has the optional carbon bucket seats, which are really thin and therefore give you more rear legroom. In terms of headroom, it's very similar. What this car doesn't have is an armrest like the RS4, uh, and it doesn't have any central sort of cup holders. It does have USB charging points, and we have um, a three zone climate control in here, but it's a shame that it doesn't have an armrest, and I think on longer journeys, that'd be a bit annoying for the rear passengers. Once you jump up front though, Wow, I mean, I have gone on and on about the driving position in the G80 and the G82 since they launched this car, and I have to say, it just doesn't get old. It's so good. I would go as far as saying that this is the best driving position from factory um, out of all cars that I've ever sat in. That includes sports cars, supercars, luxury cars, whatever. It's just brilliant. And the reason being is you sit so nice and low. As we talked about already, this particular car, my M3, has the optional carbon buckets, but even with the, let's call them, regular M Sport seats, you're still sitting a good couple of inches lower than you are in the RS4, and that is super important to me. When we talked about the ergonomics not being particularly brilliant in the Audi, they're just spot on in here. I can put my elbows on the door card and on the center console bin there, and hold the wheel really nice and comfortably. And this position on longer journeys is just amazing. And it's exactly why I love um, BMW driving positions. They always get that bit exactly right. As we mentioned on the outside, this car is about five and a half thousand pounds more expensive than the RS4 in base spec trim, but it does come with more standard equipment. All of this carbon inlay, that's standard. Head up display, standard. Harman Kardon sound system is also standard. In terms of wheel setups, well, this has got a staggered setup. So we've got 19 inch on the front axle and 20 inch on the rear, 275 and 285. So slightly wider on the rear, as you'd expect uh, on a BMW that is fundamentally on a rear wheel drive um, chassis setup. The M3 also comes standard with BMW's brilliant M adaptive suspension. That's a three-way adjustable system. You're in comfort most of the time. When you go out for a Sunday morning blast, you might go up to sport if the road's not too bumpy and horrendous. And when you take it out on track, somewhere like Silverstone, you want as much support as possible, you might put it up to Sport Plus. But having that as a standard fit system is just brilliant, especially for UK roads. This M3 is also fitted with BMW's brilliant M xDrive system. Not only does it give you a 10-way traction control, when you start it up by default, it's in four-wheel drive. You can set it to four-wheel drive sport, so it sends most of the power and torque to the rear axle, or as with my M2 preset, you can set it to two-wheel drive, where it decouples the front axle altogether and turns it into a more traditional M3 and sends all of that power and torque to the rear axle 
alone, but don't be mistaken for thinking that it'd be dangerous or lively in rear wheel drive only because whatever BMW M have done with the G80 and G82's rear diff, it just works wonders. Also, this car is on Michelin Pilot Sport 4S tires and those rears are 285 section and they do a very good job of finding lots of grip in the majority of weather. Okay, first things first, let's test out this RS4's claimed acceleration figures. Audi say it will do the 0 to 62 sprint in 4.1 seconds. My left foot is hard down on the brake, right foot is on the floor, race box is ready to go. Here we go. Oh, that's savage! And there we go. 3.42 seconds to 60 miles an hour, so you can add a tenth let's say three and a half seconds to 62. That's massively impressive and way faster than Audi claim. That's miles quicker. In fact, I think that's quicker than I've ever had out of an RS6. So maybe that's why Audi are being so conservative with the figures. That's ridiculous. Let's turn around and see if we can match that figure going the other direction. Second attempt, left foot is hard down on the brake, right foot on the accelerator. Here we go. Oh, so vicious off the line. And there we go. 3.31 <laughs> seconds. Wow. So that's an average of about 3.35 seconds to 60 miles an hour. Are Audi telling fibs about their acceleration figures, but in a good way? I think they are. I'm about 100 kilos. We've got just over half a tank of fuel. It's a lot faster than they claim. Let's see if the M3 is quicker than that. The M3 has its work cut out. 3.32 seconds for the RS4 is massively impressive. We're on the same piece of tarmac. My race box mini is ready to go. Left foot is hard down on the brake. Right foot on the accelerator. Preparing launch control. Here we go. <laughs> well, 3.14. So we've beaten it already. That didn't feel like the ideal launch. You've got to turn all the traction off in this to activate launch control. And it seemed to actually get a little bit of slip on the front axle by the feel of things. Uh, but then it gathered it all up and it was gone like a missile. Left foot is hard down on the brake. Right foot on the accelerator. Here we go, active. Yep. Getting a little bit of slip off the line. 2.99 seconds. Boom. Two point nine nine seconds this thing is ballistic that's crazy a family car <laughs> albeit 80 grand's worth will give you naught to 60 in 2.99 seconds with 100 kilos behind the wheel and three quarters of a tank of fuel wow right let's jump into the rs4 and talk about what it's been like to live with what it's like on the road. We now know this RS4 is very fast, at least in a straight line. 3.3 seconds to 60 miles an hour. I mean, that is supercar territory, and it certainly didn't embarrass itself against the even faster M3 Competition X Drive. I knew that car was going to be quicker and I wasn't expecting it to go just under three seconds because that again is just silly but let's face it a couple of tenths here or there really doesn't make much difference what has this car been like to live with what's it been like as a daily I have to say straight off the bat I really enjoyed my time with it I'm going to go through the positives and I'm going to go through 
the negatives and then we'll jump in the M3 and do exactly the same thing. I think one of its biggest uh, positives is practicality, as we talked about, massive boots. In fact, Lou and I are in the process of slowly moving house and we've used this car for trips to our storage unit, etc. And it's been really, really useful. In fact, this has been carting around the damaged wheels that came off my M3 competition, uh, which is quite ironic. Things like that are just brilliant when you've got an estate car. But as we know, there's gonna be an M3 Touring very, very soon. But that is gonna be 83 odd grand, so a lot more expensive than one of these. Another major positive with this RS4 is that 2.9 litre V6 twin turbo. Although on paper and in reality, it's 450 horsepower and 600 newton meters of torque is down on the BMW's three litre. That 600 newton meters of torque is available a lot lower down in the rev range at 1900 RPM. Whereas the BMW, we well, need to take that to 2800 RPM to get 650 newton meters. So what does that mean in reality and on the road? Well, when you're coming out of a corner like this and you're in seventh and you add more throttle, the gearbox doesn't overreact in drive. It just uses that torque and accelerates you nice and smooth out of the corner. If I'd just done that in my M3 and applied the same amount of throttle in drive and in comfort, it would have overreacted. It would have gone down two or three gears because it just doesn't have the torque down there. And I know that sounds a bit petty in an M car because you want your M car to be revving all the time and you're hoping that all that power and torque is up high and it does reward you when you're pushing on. But when you're using the S58 on the road, it does feel a bit sluggish and lazy down low. So I end up going into manual all the time, even when I'm using it to go down to the shops and back. Whereas in this car, the ZF8 speed is calibrated much better with that torquey 2.9 litre V6. My next positive with this car is that 2.9 litre V6. Oh yeah, we've just covered that. We didn't talk about its sound. It sounds epic when you're pushing on. And as far as I can tell, it's mostly organic sound. It sounds really good from the outside. Yes, it's muted because this car was built in 2022 and it has to go past all the restrictions and legislations, etc. But it just sounds so good, whether you're giving it gentle throttle inputs or whether you're booting it down the road. And it has a lovely overrun burble as well. Nothing too dramatic or over the top. Right, let's get on to the bad bits about this RS4. First one we've already touched upon, and that's driving position and these seats. They're not horrendous or even bad, they just don't suit lanky frames like mine. I feel like I'm sitting on the seat instead of in the seat, and compared to the M3, even with the standard uh, M Sport seats, the RS4 falls a long way behind in my opinion. The next negative to talk about that sits alongside the average driving position and these average seats is the interior. And once again, it's kind of average compared to the M3. And that's comparing it to my M3's interior. Remember, they've just updated it with the curb display. And I think if you put those two together, you would really feel this was very dated. This big pop-up infotainment screen was all the rage five or six years ago, but it's really dated so fast and I keep wanting to put it down but it's a permanent fixture. Saying that the virtual cockpit kind of makes up for a lot of that and at least we've got proper climate controls here. We don't need to go into the touchscreen system to activate any of the climate controls or seat heating etc and I do like that. I just feel that this car is getting on a little bit now which it is and kind of feels a little bit old in here compared to cars like the M3. The next negative to talk about is the fact that this car doesn't have DRC, dynamic ride control or adaptive suspension in BMW talk. 
what that means is we have a passive setup which just feels a little bit stiff for the UK. You literally feel every bump and every cat's eye on the road. I'm sure the fact that this car has the bigger 20 inch wheels with tiny 35 profile tires doesn't help, but I would really consider ticking that 2,000 pound DRC box because if you live anywhere near like I do, the roads are so, so bad and this car just never settles out. And even on the motorway and nicer roads, it just feels a little bit stiffly sprung and you wish that you could just switch it into a more comfortable setting. The RS6's air suspension, for instance, is miles ahead of this in terms of comfort, but what that negative turns into is a positive when you find some bends it seems to be really well supported so I think they've set it up to be more sporty than more comfortable which is fine if you're using it as more of a sports car but not if you're using it as a daily it's another one of those cars that has a Jekyll and Hyde character about it if you drive it and drive all day long and take it easy do quickly forget how capable it is but it does feel a little bit behind the M3 let's go and jump in that and I can give you my positives and negatives go through the good points and the bad points and then come up with some kind of conclusion at the end. What's the first good point? Well, it's a number of good points. It's in here. It's the driving position, the seats, and although these are the optional carbon buckets, which I highly recommend for most people, unless you're using this as a daily that you're jumping in and out of, let's say six to eight times a day, where the standard M Sport seats are probably better. These seats otherwise are just amazing. But I do understand that they're three and a half grand, so that brings this car into even more of an expensive price bracket. Um, but let's just base it on the regular seats. You're still getting a better driving position, still getting more comfortable, more supportive seats. You're getting a nicer interior in general. The infotainment system in this car with the old layout and the new M3 and M4, or the updated ones that come with the curved display, still a much nicer and better infotainment system and more up to date than the one that's in the Audi. The head up display, which is standard in this car and optional in the RS4, is much better in the BMW. Another major positive in this M3 as we're going along an awfully rough piece of road is the standard fit M adaptive suspension. It's three way adjustable and to be fair, yes I'm in comfort 95% of the time when I'm on the road but it's nice to have those adjustments and when it's in comfort it is more plush than Audi's passive setup in the RS4 and it extends beyond that. When I go into the setup menu down here I have so many different settings that I can play with and I can set my preset M buttons on the wheel and yes the RS4 does have an RS button on there but you don't get anywhere near the adjustability especially when we're talking about things like the 10-way traction control the different or various four-wheel drive settings that we've already touched upon and the fact that you can decouple the front axle altogether and make it a rear-wheel drive BMW next and final positive about the M3 is this car's driving dynamics and let's face it most people that are looking for one of these or an IS4 driving dynamics are surely quite high up on their list and this car when you put it in the right settings and you're along one of your favorite roads and you put your foot down it's just a ballistic missile it really is we already know that it will do 0 to 60 miles an hour in three seconds flat which is just ludicrous and that does mean that your fun is spoiled 
very quickly on the road at legal speeds anyway but even taking one of these out on track it doesn't feel like a duck out of water it feels incredible i'm in my favorite preset now which is four wheel drive sport with everything switched off fifth gear fourth gear third gear come into here amazing front end put your foot down and it's just so fast <laughs> it's ridiculous but it has the handling and the chassis to match the pace it also has the brakes really good brakes and they're also adjustable uh, within the setup menu so i can go from comfort which is kind of the default mode um, up to sport i prefer to use sport even when i'm on the road because it gives you a bit more feel in the pedal and the brakes are more responsive they've just got a lovely feel lovely responsiveness and I know that they will work on track lap after lap after lap. Yes, it chews through brake pads, but the brakes will continue to slow down this 1800 kilo rocket ship. Now we're gonna get onto the negatives with this car. The first one being sound. Now, my particular M3 has a Miltec exhaust on it, but the stock car just lacks any real sound. You get a lot of fake interior sound. Um, and even with the Miltec system on there, the S58 isn't the most sonorous, just like the S55. It's not the best sounding six spot on the market. And I think the Audi's V6 definitely sounds better. And as we talked about with the RS4, one of its positives, which was that really good low down torque, well, this car doesn't have that low down torque and I've gone on about that a fair amount in various G80 and G82 videos over the past 18 months that unfortunately low down this car really struggles to pull so if you're on the motorway at 70 miles an hour and you start going up a slight incline and you've got a couple of people in the car it will change down one or two gears sometimes which is madness when you think about it because this car has so much power and so much torque but all of it is towards the top of the rev range and there's really nothing below let's say about 2200 2300 rpm which is where you spend most of your time if you're using this car as a daily and you're not wringing its neck and i know it's a bit of an argument because obviously you want your m car to respond when you are wringing its neck and this car does but it's just a shame that there's nothing down low because when you're coming through a left hand like this and I'm in seventh gear at 50 miles an hour, I'll put my foot down a little bit more and it's just changed down to fifth gear. So it went down two cogs because the software knows that it could not pull me out of that situation in seventh gear. And that's a little bit annoying when you're using it as your daily. <laughs> Another negative with the M3 is something that I go on about a lot with modern BMWs and modern BMW M cars, and that is lack of organic steering feel. It's a little bit numb. It's a really nice ratio and steering rack, um, and the front end, the front axle grip, and its ability is unreal, but it's just lacking a bit of feel, and I'd argue and say that the RS4 maybe has a little bit more steering feel, which is something I also experienced with the RS3 and the M240i. RS3's definitely got more steering feel than the M240i, um, but that's taking nothing away from this car's brilliant front end. It's just definitely another small negative that I'd point out with the M3. takes the win and it's not a narrow margin either it's a newer car and it feels it it's faster it's dynamically a lot better as far as I'm concerned it has more adjustability it's a nicer place to sit it's a nicer cabin and yes as we talked about it does have its downfalls it does even have its weak points against the RS4 like its engine. I'm not saying the S58 is <laughs> is a weaker engine because it's not. It's just not as good an engine as the V6 in the Audi, 
as a everyday unit and also the Audi is a little bit more efficient than this X-Drive. It's a shame because my old rear wheel drive car, well that was capable of 40 miles to the gallon on long runs. This one was struggled to get over 30 so you obviously lose a lot of energy in the uh, X-Drive system. I'll be driving the RS4 competition in the next couple of weeks and I really hope that they've extracted some more at least driving dynamics out of that car. I think interior wise etc it's going to be very similar but I hope that it's a bit more enjoyable and fun to drive and I hope that it brings the game between the M3 and the RS4 a bit closer because my fear for Audi at least is when the M3 Touring finally hits the showrooms in a couple of months time I just can't see any reason really that anyone would go out and buy an RS4. Obviously we haven't talked about looks but they're very personal and I don't mind the way the M3 and M4 look but I would agree that the RS4 probably does as an overall package look a little bit better. And I want to say a massive thanks to my fiance Lou for helping me with this twin test because it's impossible for me to do a twin test on my own as you can imagine I need to take both cars to a location so I can do all the intro stuff etc so huge thanks Lou for giving me half of your Sunday I will see you all at another video very very soon cheers